Welcome to Wednesdays with Whiteman. Uh, today we're going to be talking about educational technology readiness. In the chat box, if you want to know what your school will look like when the school reopens in the fall, uh, we'd be very interested to uh, know what that is and please share it in the chat box. Okay, well, it's one o'clock. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, again, if uh, you get an opportunity, please use the chat box to ask any questions as we go through our presentation. So my name is George Kaken. I'm the education sector leader for Whiteman. I will be your facilitator today. And I'm also a registered uh, educational planner. Uh, Wednesdays at Whiteman, uh, we developed this forum for superintendents during these unprecedented times uh, to learn and become informed and ask questions and share their best practices. Today's presentation will focus on how to help students and staff prepare for the unknown. Really, it's all about educational technology readiness and how we use that technology in engaging students. We also have today on our panel, Dr. Tom Langdon, a part-time superintendent and mentor for Walkerville Public Schools. He's also an educational consultant uh, with Whiteman. I'm very happy and pleased to announce that uh, Scott Brun, president and CEO of Wright and Hunter, who works with many of the school districts here in Michigan, uh, dealing with technology and security, uh, specializing in educational technology and security for the last 26 years. And also back in 1995, uh, is, was computer-based training author. And our special guest today is Dr. John Monberg. He's a professor, Department of Writing and Rhetoric and American Cultures at Michigan State University. He teaches digital rhetoric and experience architecture eight years he worked as a software developer and also taught at the University of Kansas and the University of Louisville. So a uh, couple of Wednesdays with Whitemans ago, uh, we had Nikki on uh, to talk about the Michigan Safe Schools Roadmap. Uh, what our subject matter is today is how does the educational educational piece fold into the roadmap? Oftentimes, uh, we see this Michigan Safe Start Roadmap, and this really uh, reflects the risk levels in the different parts of the state of Michigan. As you can see that the Detroit and Saginaw area are in the high risk area, whereas the western part of the state is in the medium high risk area, and then Traverse City is in the medium risk area. Those don't necessarily directly correlate with the Michigan Safe Schools Roadmap. In the Michigan Safe Schools Roadmap, currently uh, the state, the majority of the state is in phase four, and I believe Traverse City in the Upper Peninsula is in phase five. And the difference between phase four and five is that there are many safety protocols required in phase four, where those required protocols are greatly reduced in phase five. So as we talk about phase four, uh, doing a lot of online learning and distance learning, uh, it's critical that those lessons and those engagements with students are meaningful. Going back to the governor's return to school advisory council, the guiding principles for that council were four items. First is to have equitable access to learning, regardless of what phase you're in. The second is to use data and evidence to prioritize resources for each child in each student. The third is to pr prioritize deep, meaningful relationships to create safe learning environments, whether they are in person or online. And then the fourth one is to empower students and parents as it relates to all aspects of learning and emotional support for families. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Uh, John Monberg, uh, professor at Michigan State University, to talk about the guiding principles for remote instruction. John? 
Hi, uh, thanks for uh, having me uh, give a chance to share my insights. Um, I start teaching next week, so these um, principles are high on my mind as I start to uh, put the syllabus together. And I think they echo the principles in the last slide. So the first principle, uh, shared common space. I wanna make sure that there's a shared common emotional space in the classroom. Um, students have a lot less social contact than they're used to having. There's a lot of uncertainty in their lives. So on the first day, I want to make sure they have a chance to see me as a person, that they have a chance to kind of present themselves to the other people in class, and they have a, a chance to um, work together so that we, from the very beginning of the semester, feel like we're connected. Second principle is organization. Uh, students feel they're digital natives, they feel like they have a lot of technical savvy, but they're not always good about um, the different tools that are used on an online teaching environment. So um, I'm using different videos. We have a D2L uh, classroom management system. We use Google Docs. I want to make sure that um, things are labeled clearly and consistently. They're in one place and um, to minimize the risk that students get lost. Third principle, right, equity and feeling welcomed. So um, it's obvious when students don't have high speed internet or a powerful computer, but technical barriers go beyond that issue. Um, do students have a quiet study space? Do students know what questions they need to ask to form relationships with teachers and instructors? Do they feel welcomed? Are there readings in the class by um, scholars and people who look like them? So equity and feeling welcomed go far beyond just providing Wi-Fi access. Uh, fourth issue, low stakes activities. Um, interactivity can take many different forms and so I'd like to do some setup questions ahead of time. Then I'll have, and I'll give students an assignment where they know they're going to have to do some written response. Then we can have a breakout room in Zoom using Google Documents so different groups of students can work on different questions. And then at the end, students can have their own writing response. And in that way, um, they can see the intellectual moves that other students make. They feel part of a learning process. They know they have to be engaged. We can do some scale one-on-one -on -one breakout room and then come together as a class and, and understand what was learned. And the fifth point is appropriate use of video. Um, it takes four times the number of hours to put together a polished video than it does to put together lecture notes. And if teachers spend a lot of time doing talking head video where the lighting is not perfect and the sound isn't perfect, um, students tune that out very quickly. So um, looking for the right kind of video in the classroom and balancing between an active classroom where there's a lot of discussion and students understand the payoff from the discussion. And then there's time outside of the classroom for reading and watching videos and those things. And I think taken together, this will deliver a pretty solid learning experience, even in a distance learning setting. Well, thank you, John. And we appreciate that insight and you know these principles for success. Um, now we'd like to have uh, Scott talk a little bit about kind of where we've been and where we're going. Thank you very much. And uh, again, appreciate the invitation uh, and, and your attendance today to this uh, important topic. Obviously, I know over the last uh, several months since, since June, you've been thinking of how September might look to you. So just wanted to draw kind of a comparison there in March. We really had to shut things down on the 13th and got those orders very quickly that there would be no in-person instruction. And really our staff made the best effort at, at creating a remote learning environment uh, quickly uh, to uh, minimize any interruption in instruction. 
um, some, some minimal professional development was possible in a matter of days before things had to get up and running. Um, teachers were racing to modify those, those weekly lesson plans and really keep up using simple conferencing tools. Uh, and, and everyone struggled uh, in one way or another, students, parents, staff, in trying to um, keep learn, teaching and learning happening uh, through this pandemic. One of the biggest challenges uh, most districts had was getting devices in, in students' hands. Uh, so the distribution of that, uh, and then supporting these remote users, not only the students, but the staff, in maintaining that instructional and avoiding and minimizing interruptions to that. So really expectations in March were for students to provide their best efforts and for our teachers to provide a pass-fail um, grade for, uh, for our K-12 students. In September, things look uh, somewhat the same and somewhat different. Um, each, each district obviously has their own uh, capabilities within the phases uh, directed by the governor, as we talked about earlier. But right now, we are able to do in-person instruction. Uh, our clients are primarily K-12. I have a mix of folks that are completely online to start in September, some that are uh, completely in person and some that are running in hybrid. Really depends on a lot of different factors, but uh, we've got a mixed environment. So, and an environment that may change. So the staff now has to make its best efforts to prepare for the unknown. We may start in person, we may start remote um, or blended somewhere in between or even with a self-paced virtual learning type of environment. Just depends on the district, the resources, uh, and the abilities to get up and running uh, for the start of school. This is obviously, I don't need to tell you as educators, this is a different way of teaching and learning and uh, guiding your teachers um, through mentoring and ongoing professional development is going to be important throughout this process. Uh, and, and better use of, of more collaborative learning platforms and again, back to what John mentioned is organization of those materials so that students and teachers know where those are. Um, assignments are not missing or, or not uh, received by the, the teacher instructor. Uh, and that those lessons are consistent amongst your subject matters and in, in your grades. Um, the other part is we're now going to be responsible for monitoring the participation and progress of these students uh, because ultimately uh, assessments and grading are gonna be happening now here in September. So um, the best effort now has gone up a stage into um, truly assessing and grading students. We will still need to deal with distribution of, could you just go back for one second there? We'll still need to deal with uh, the distribution of those devices, uh, two back. <clears throat> and getting the, uh, um, the technical support, support for those remote users, which I'll talk a little bit about in the next slide. Next slide, please. So we talk about all these different terms and I wanna make sure that we're using the same terms. So, and now it begins. Uh, whatever it is for your district, uh, I just wanna make sure that we're, we're explaining this in, in, a, in a common uh, use of terms. Remote or online instruction really is no in-person instruction. Uh, but we're raised basically from a remote location, whether that be from our classroom or from home or somewhere else. Uh, the teacher is in one location and the student is in another. Uh, mainly it's teacher led and these lesson plans are available uh, both live and potentially even recorded for later access to review a subject. Um, we also look at the hybrid or the blended where you have limited in person. This is a, a popular uh, selection right now for many, many of our districts that we work with where certain days of the week, the students will be in class in person and the other days of the week, they will be remote and from home uh, to re receive instruction. Again, mainly teacher led and those lesson plans would be a lot available live as they're going through them and hopefully recorded so they can access them later. Virtual is really, again, no in-person instruction. This is more the pre-recorded and self-paced instruction. This would be more of something you may purchase uh, where the student can move at any, any particular individualized pace. Um, they're really, really in charge and in, in leading their own online instruction. Those lesson plans are available on demand and that's more of a, uh, a virtual environment, if you will, versus a remote or hybrid environment. Amongst any of these environments, we have common goals. And now, especially in September, we're being required to, to monitor these students uh, and their progress um, and support those individual learning styles. Not everyone uh, learns well online. So some will take more effort and, and uh, different approaches 
to help them through that process and maximize how they do in your classes. Um, what does the district need? Well, hardware. Many of these components are in place in your districts. And although uh, a large portion or a majority may be uh, remote, you still need a firewall to protect your network. That firewall, unfortunately, was designed to have 80, 90% of your staff and students in the school district. Now everyone's coming from the outside or a, a large number are, and those firewalls don't have the capacity uh, to be able to keep up with that type of um, traffic. You may have already experienced that back in March when you transferred everyone out to a remote type of environment. Um, but we want to make sure that that firewall is going to have the capacity and throughput to support a large number of users. This has happened across industry as well in the commercial markets. Large uh, organizations, um, their remote uh, staff was typically maybe 10%, and that's what their firewall and their uh, content filtering and, and VPN networks were designed for. And they had to very quickly ramp those up to be able to do that. But imagine most of your technical folks have these things in place just reminders to make sure that we're thinking of these. The other is web, web content filtering, filtering. Although the student is remote and maybe not in front of you or in your district facilities, you are still responsible um, to, con to filter that content for any inappropriate, um, any inappropriate materials. So that even on a remote device or a student device that's not owned by the district, we need to provide that protection uh, for the children and uh, accessing the, the uh, content. Virtual private networks, that's really more for staff. That's something that if you have a system that's not installed on their home or on their uh, computer at, at home, that they have a secure tunnel into your network. And this becomes very important for things like gradebook, uh, student information systems, those types of things, that you have a, a secure, if you will, tunnel or pathway that uh, that no one can get into those systems. Uh, you wanna make sure that you have that remote access for your staff to be able to continue to do their jobs. And then although we may only have a portion of our student and staff population in the schools, the wireless network infrastructure is still critical. Because this, this situation remains fluid, we could change uh, into a phase five where increased uh, in-person instruction would happen. And maybe even uh, at, at some point phase six where we've eradicated and we're back in full in-person in instruction. The, the message here is be prepared for that transition. And when that transition happens, I think you're going to be leaning a lot more on these computing devices in, in, when you're back in the classroom. So being able to support 30 devices in a single classroom and 30 more in the next classroom over is gonna become critical because as we get into this one-to-one -one remote access learning, um, we're going to start finding some efficiencies, efficiencies in it, as we probably have working from home. Uh, things are different, but there are ways to be uh, effective and efficient. Um, again, the computer, computing devices. This is a, a, an inequ equity issue, uh, an availability issue, but obviously to receive remote uh, uh, learning, you need a computer device. The biggest thing I want to mention on this is make sure that you tag that equipment that student that's district owned so that you have an identifier, make sure you're maintaining an inventory, there's a sign out process, there's a student responsibilities that's set with the student and parent, and an expectation for damage causes. Um, these conversations and these types of tracking need to be in place up front to make sure you get back what you sent out. And then from a support perspective beyond the hardware, that ongoing professional development to continue to grow your staff in this unique uh, environment um, that's going to require remote technology or technical support uh, and really reviewing what are your current technology staffing levels to provide that remote support because no longer are you just supporting the computers in the buildings and, compu and the computers at the teacher's desks, but now all of the student teach students out at their individual homes. So you're going to need to look at remote access and control tools to control those computers so that your technicians can get into a student or teacher's desk uh, computer and actually make modifications and correct the situation. Next slide, please. And then what does the student need? Uh, we talked about, uh, John talked about the, the other side. I'm talking about the hardware side, which is really 
high speed internet. And that really is defined as a minimum of 25 megabits per second. We would really like to see folks have 100 megabit per second speed. Um, and the reason for that is um, they may be not the only person at home sharing that connection. There may be another student or students, uh, your parents may be at home, uh, they may be working. These video calls do chew up bandwidth um, and the, the bandwidth is shared amongst your neighbors as well. So we really like to see a high speed bandwidth. We also realize that not everyone has high speed internet at home. So I've seen districts using hotspots, um, whether those are for individual homes, uh, others have put them on buses and use parking lots. I've seen a lot of that happen, but that access is critical. Uh, computing devices, I've got bad news for you, is the best priced device out there is a Chromebook, and there, everybody in the country has figured that out, and we have a massive, massive backlog on computing, computing devices. Um, so it's not unlikely to see, not weeks, but months of backlogs before devices are going to be able to ship. So be prepared to work with what you have right now and place your orders as soon as you can for those devices. An alternate to that is to consider student-owned devices. Um, this is an option. You do need to look at that from a, um, an internet uh, filtering perspective to make sure that you're filtering that device from any inappropriate content and that you have some sort of remote control or technical assistance available for that student loan device. And that communication and support between the student, the parent, teachers needs to, is critical for this. From a parental perspective, we need that, that, that uh, parent to help with the student uh, get the computer on, get logged into where they need to be, maintain that schedule uh, that is set for them on a daily basis. So someone, an adult at home that can handle that responsibility. Um, and then just making sure that simple things like that computing device is maintained and disinfected and charged and assist the students with their assignments and questions and, and play kind of a, a role with, between the parent, or excuse me, the student and the teacher to help support them and monitor their progress or help with their challenges. Finally, uh, next, next slide please. Finally, who's gonna pay for all this? Well, we did hear the governor speak uh, recently that $65 million in CARE Act funding, um, named the GEAR, uh, there's the uh, Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund, will be released to Michigan school districts. Um, their goals are to, hope to help to close this digital divide, which is devices, internet access, those types of things, improve access to in-person mental health services, um, we've heard time and time from the health professionals that isolation, long-term isolation um, can be detrimental. So being there and available to provide those services as needed to students, parents, uh, and your staff. Um, and then uh, small group learning, they're trying to encourage uh, help with childcare and supply PPE and cleaning supplies. So that was just announced uh, recently. Um, so we'll wait to see how that, that transpires. That will most likely be based on need. So you'll be looking at your free and reduced. I'm sure there'll be an equation to what happens there, um, but that is yet to be announced. Um, other opportunities for funding are some, some COVID grants specifically. We have some slides at the end that'll be shared with this presentation for current grants right now, quarterly grants ongoing, and then there are all kinds of state, county, and federal options out there. Uh, I encourage you to look into that as you're challenged with funding uh, these initiatives. Some other free resources um, for digital si uh, citizenship, um, teaching strategies, and other resources that are available to teachers are all included at the end of this uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Tom Langdon to uh, ask our guests some pointed questions. All right, and uh, these are probably gonna be up for grabs. So uh, as we go forward, uh, first of all, I guess I would, uh, before we get to those questions, I know that uh, George is putting those up there right now. So I'm gonna, first of all, ask um, John um, on the uh, university side, as you went into this in the spring, uh, we all kind of got caught unawares. So as you uh, approach this new kind of style, you did have some live classes you were doing in the spring, even though you're an expert on the, the digital piece, correct? The first half of the semester started as usual, 
and then uh, there were rumors that things could change, but uh, very quick, you know, we had one day to move to an online learning environment. So obviously you had the same challenge as the public schools did. And it, it, did you have the requirements in the college level to have to act, actually still, and I'm sure I know the answer to this, assess the students? And how did that change as far as being able to assess students uh, online and, and get their, um, get the quantitative piece, the grades back, that kind of thing for the semester grades? Mm -hmm. um, most of the classes I do are project-based and involved uh, and some writing assignments and some larger project-based work. So um, scaling down, uh, I'm, I'm teaching a user research class and the first day of the semester I said the most important thing with user research is that you have physical face-to-face -face discussions with people. Um, so I had to kind of shift gears with that pretty dramatically. And so um, reducing the number of assignments, uh, reducing some of the um, details connected with those assignments, um, that was important. And then providing the time we have in class to make sure that students understood what I was looking for, what the grading criteria were about, uh, to give them a chance to share ideas with other students so they could see what other students were wrestling with. Um, so it was cutting back on some of the requirements and creating more space for students to kind of work through challenges. Okay, fantastic. And I guess uh, one, the first question that we had, and I guess uh, directed uh, again to um, uh, Dr. Momberg is the whole idea of the shared common space. It's, I think it's fascinating. I haven't heard this piece before. Um, could you elaborate a little more on that and just give some examples of how that worked um, within your milieu? Yeah. Uh, back in the 1990s, Howard Rheingold, who um, did a lot of work with education and technology back with the uh, Whole Earth Catalog, back when Silicon Valley was about um, liberation and personal empowerment and autonomy. So he, he comes out of that tradition, but um, education, unless students feel emotionally connected to some material and feeling like that what they're doing is meaningful, and every semester, every classroom has a different culture, right? um, it's, it's no uh, mystery at all that the vast majority of the kind of MOOCs, those massive online courses, maybe two or three percent of people passed those. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by how much material is available in really uh, polished lesson plans through like Khan Academy or different YouTube clips. But unless people f can build time into their day, unless they know that there's some kind of goal that they're working for, unless they have a shared emotional connection with other people, it's very hard for people to kind of work through material independently. And, and one of the most troublesome aspects from my point of view is that for a lot of first generation students or students whose families are struggling with time and income, online education is, is pitched as something that's liberatory because you can have a lot of flexibility about your time and you can and study from anywhere. But if, if you don't have built into your day that kind of connection, if you don't have support from peers, if you don't know what questions you aren't asking, um, you could run into some huge problems with that. So having a shared emotional culture that pulls people in um, makes a gigantic difference. Well, you know, I really saw that with, with my own daughter. She's uh, going into eighth grade and I got her on Khan Academy immediately when this happened and she was doing the English and the math. But it went really well for about a month and a half and then it just started slacking off and just today I reminded her have you been on there no I haven't been on there for the week and you know that's human nature I think the motivation piece with the relationship piece and I think that may be a, a great takeaway for us is the fact that you can you know you know give the course all the water potential that they want to drink but if they don't you know feel motivated to they're not going to and that's a great point so um could I shouldn't be on individual 
effort. Willpower, individual willpower isn't enough. It needs to be systematic and structured if we want students to have a good learning experience. Great, Mike, Michael had made a point on the chat box and he said he had to get off at 1.30 for a meeting, but I, I wanted to make sure that we had a ch chance to address it and that's pretty much what uh, Dr. Langdon and, and John were talking about, that um, there were a lot of parents who are um, not feeling that they had a very uh, good experience back in the spring it, when things shifted so s suddenly in March that uh, there wasn't a very robust learning experience for the students. And so there is that comparison that Scott had put up between March and September. Mm -hmm. What are the things that are going to happen differently in September to make sure that um, there aren't parents feeling cynical about the online learning experience and that students are going to be engaged uh, in, in September? Absolutely. Uh, so along those same themes about the connect and engage with students, Scott, um, on your side is, is not the uh, actually uh, the academic that actually engages with students, but what have you seen that'll, that can really bring students into the conversation? Of course, relationships, as we said, were incredibly important, but uh, what other things, technologically speaking, could we do in, in, in you know, even wide range or bigger bigger picture rather than a specific program? What can be done to make these students feel like they want to really dig in? Well, I think uh, uh, John made a very good point, which is to establish a relationship, which is, is difficult to, be, to happen when we're in this environment, but for them to see your face, to, to introduce, uh, you know, some of the same things that John was saying, introduce yourself, become a person to them, not just a, a box in this Brady Bunch format, um, and, and, and get them to know you, and listen to them and give those students a chance to introduce themselves to their classmates because they're not surrounded by the same people they were with in March. And there's something that happens at the beginning of a school year in K-12 where folks are, are put into a classroom, they look around the classroom, their friends, their new friends, those types of things, that engagement and that conversation still needs to happen. So as much as we want to, to introduce a lesson and proceed through the lesson, assess how the student is, is, is um, in, in learning, we also want to make sure that 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 there's some there's some some social aspects to that. Maybe there's a, a quick ice breaking game you could play with 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 the students to kind of get them out of that stale mode of the day they might be having. Um, with the younger ones, maybe just standing up and shake it out. You know, let's get some you know stand up, move around, and uh, let them get a little energy out. Um, you know, I, we've heard about these uh, these individual educational pods that some communities are creating and they're choosing to, to bring in tutors and work together. And part of that platform, I heard this on the, on the news a couple of nights ago, was they were having this tutor not teach the students, allow the, the, the district to do that, but they were responsible to make sure that everything's working, that the kids are taking a snack, that they go have a recess, that those type of normal activities, um, you have some of that normalcy. Um, so I, that and, and, and maintaining a schedule. I think what we talked about, uh, Greg, it might've been you that mentioned as we got to that March time frame that folks would be doing quite well, Tom, you had mentioned your daughter and then it kind of faded off. Again, I think they start to see that and they see that repetition and the kind of you know monotone type of thing. There needs to be some excitement. There needs to be some uh, activity in kind of a real sedentary environment. It kind of reminds me of the guy that it's about four thirty in the commercial that says, "Got to make the donuts," type thing. You know, it just comes, <laughs> you know, and then he did, he didn't seem very motivated to me in those commercials. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the, Dr. Momberg, you mentioned some things again with the uh, how to you know the low stakes piece. Now, I thought this was one of those pieces that was kind of an eye opening for me as well. You talked about doing a maybe a quick writing sample, like the old I tip from decades ago, those kind of things. But what what other kinds of things? I, I, you know, we try to use some competition involved in, you know, maybe uh, that kind of thing. It's, it, it's almost impossible to do that, it would seem, on, online. But what, are there some other areas that you can think of with low stakes where um, it's not going to be a, an actual quantitative test, but it's going to be more of a um, let's get together and, and try to find some commonality between each other and, and start the process where people are at least engaged from the beginning of the class? 
Yes, um, so I'm teaching a user research class and, and some of it is um, uh, kind of ethnographic kind of field work where you go into a setting and listen and pay attention and be participant observation. Um, and there are ways of taking that activity and putting it into a classroom. So people, you know, college students are used to thinking about um, uh, coffee houses and what it's like to be in a coffee house. And um, uh, I think Herman Miller did a piece on using uh, ethnography in a corporate setting and, and did a quick ethnography uh, and they compared a coffee house in Benton Harbor to one in Jakarta, Indonesia. Um, and as students read that ahead of time and then think about the little things that make the coffee house that they're used to distinctive, there's a way you can um, spend like 15 minutes in a Google document creating like 30 or 40 little details and then there's a way of synthesizing those details into themes collectively. And um, so any skill that I'm trying to teach, I'm looking for ways of bringing that into the classroom where there's enough scaffolding and enough understanding of the skill and it can be done in a limited amount of time. Um, yeah, in, 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 um, yeah, people's attention span, you know, something like 20 minutes long. So I try to make sure that in an, you know, if I'm teaching a class for 80 minutes, I've got four different kinds of activities and we shift back and forth. And I, in a in a face-to-face -face classroom, I am used to asking students to stand up or move into groups. And uh, I'll have to think about that with Zoom, <laughs> uh, building in time to ask them to stand up and move around would be a great idea, I think. We even talked about having our phys ed teacher being online when he was doing his classes and said, you know, if you run around your house three times and if your mom and dad substantiate that, that's kind of your lesson. And now you have to go down and work on your practice swings or that kind of thing. Uh, it's mm -hmm. it's going to be some probably some collaboration with parents or older siblings. But I guess we're just drawing whatever we can find it, it, during these times. So. You know, I, I, I wanted to ask um, George if we're uh, what our time frame is, if we're, we're going to wrap up around uh, uh, quarter of the hour if I should give it back to you or do you want to pursue some more questions or open it up to other people to ask questions? What are you thinking? Uh, we still have uh, about 10 minutes. So okay. I think it'd be great if we could open this up for everybody that's on the call. Uh, if you have any questions beyond uh, what we're asking, uh, please uh, unmute your mic and go ahead and ask the question. And as we're waiting for uh, the questions to be asked, I had a question for, uh, for Scott. In, in terms of preparation time, uh, you know, going back to the slides where you talked about, you know, the firewall and some of the other connectivity issues uh, that school districts are tackling right now. Uh, let's say my firewall is not you know, compatible with the, the type of traffic that I'm currently having. Is that something that could be done like, you know, over an evening, a weekend, or do we have to order parts that have to come from some place? And then, you know, does it take a month to install or 10 minutes? So um, in general, uh, like you've probably seen with multiple items, uh, the, um, the lead time on a lot of products everything from you know dryers that are, are less than nine hundred dollars to uh, computing devices like Chromebooks that are two hundred fifty dollars. Um, if I'm to order a firewall tomorrow, it could be it could be months to get something new. Um, you may be able to get something sooner. Uh, I would imagine most of the folks in these districts have already uh, looked at that type of capacity and have made their adjustments. I would encourage them to work with the vendors that they work with now with their network infrastructure. They may have some loaner equipment or some equipment that can be used while before that, before that new equipment arrives. So I think the best way to a quick solution would be to talk to those technology vendors you've worked with in the past, leverage those relationships to get yourself back up and running at a level that's gonna to maintain uh, you know, that type of capacity. 
But um, as far as putting in a firewall, I mean, that's something that can be done overnight. Okay. Well, th thanks for that answer. Tom, Absolutely. go ahead. You just have to get it first, right, Scott? That's the, yeah. that's the hard part. That's, that's the hard part. That's the hard part. Right, My wife right. told me yesterday that our carpet just got back ordered. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, you know, anything and everything, um, you see the availability, it says, oh, we're shipping, and then you'll see two-week delay. Right. Um, I've just, got districts that we're going to put a phone system in in June, and now we're aiming for December. Uh, common themes. So it's a very common <laughs> themes. So I don't want to. I don't want to be uh, to be negative about it. I want to be realistic about it. That if the first answer from these people is nope, we can't get you anything for two months. That's not where you should stop. Go go talk to those vendors that help keep your networks up and running, and see how they can, might be able to get you through it. Yeah, I, I, I told you. Uh, yeah, yes, I had a, a another question about equity. I know in some earlier um, sessions we had talked about unique and uh, original ideas that school districts have come up with to address that issue about students either not having the uh, computers or the internet speeds uh, at home, and how do you address that? And th you know, early on we had talked about how even in rural districts, it had there were school districts that were putting Wi-Fi on the buses. Originally, it was so that students could work on their uh, lessons as they went home from school on the school bus if they had a long route in a rural area. And then districts were parking those buses in strategic locations around the community, like a church parking lot, so that uh, parents could bring their kids at least to gain. Wi-Fi access and, and have that available. And so are there other um, unique um, solutions to that issue of equity about how you can make sure that students have access? And I know, uh, John, you had mentioned even in the college level, there often is a disparity and uh, students may not have a quiet, safe, uh, place at home, let alone one that has Wi-Fi with a high-speed connection with, with a computer at home. Uh, how, how do you go about reaching out to them if they have that access? Um, kind of related to that, I think, um, in a normal class, students often don't come to office hours or they may not ask questions. And uh, as I got to know students over the semester, I could tell some students felt um, kind of alienated in general by higher education, by formal education. So just making an extra effort to kind of reach out to them to make sure that they felt included to um, give them questions to ask um, and to give them more feedback on their work outside of class where um, they wouldn't feel kind of stigmatized in class. So all of those, I think if you create that emotional connection where people feel welcomed into learning and that it's important to their lives, then there might be ways of overcoming the technical limitations. But without that, if you feel like this is another system that you aren't really welcomed in, it's so easy to drift away and then feel bad about yourself and then and, and disengage. Um, so as a teacher, just making it an extra effort to make sure that students feel connected and not let them drift away it was something I felt good about in this spring semester. I had a couple of students who were at risk of doing that and everyone was able to kind of do a solid job in the class. The, the other side of, uh, on the K-12 side of it, um, we have a you know free and reduced lunch program where we can identify students that potentially have financial uh, challenges. So um, in a lot of cases, or in, in all cases, my my uh, K twelve districts have been uh, surveying uh, parents and students as to what they would like to see, how they would like it to work, whether or not they have a computing device, whether or not they have internet access. So I think they have kind of a tool in place to be able to ask those questions and then compare it to another list and say, all right, here's a, a certain percentage who hasn't responded. I need to reach out to those folks uh, and, and make sure that they are prepared within a learning environment that's appropriate. Um, 
because you know the the other thing we talked about in in, in our internal conversations is and, and to to John's point is not everyone's proud about their background um, mm -hmm. of where they're at or that they are you know crouched in a closet and don't have um, these other things that other people have in their background so you know if that's something that's that's uncomfortable to somebody they have those virtual backgrounds they have these types of things that can kind of uh, mask with maybe they're not wanting others to see in their in their their house well, there's also the the idea that there's the ultimate inequity is our students who don't have you know any of the any of that uh, virtual capability at all because of religious preference like uh, uh, some of the schools in the northern Michigan area that have Amish uh, students, you know, th there uh, there's some schools that are predominantly um, Amish, and so at that point, the ult the ultimate way to provide equity is going to still be those uh, paper packets, um, at least while we're in, in this uh, danger uh, zone at this danger phase, and to get those back and forth and get those uh, quality graded. So that's not really virtual education, but it's in lieu of education, I guess you could call it. So I guess we have to really, you know, be very careful about, you know, how we address every single student. And, you know, I think that Dr. Monberg mentioned, you know, those, those houses that are very small and may have four or five kids in them and everybody's running around and other people want to be using the computers as well. I don't think we could ever have the expectation that um, even 70% of our students have ideal conditions. And I would guess more like 30 or 35, if you're talking about noise level and being able to have your own little spot. So um, that's the challenge. And I, I think that as we look at these challenges, we're only gonna get better in time. That's the key and you know, working, relying on experts like we have today and, and work, working with other, our peers and colleagues to ask questions and find out the best way to fine tune this thing. Uh, one other thought I had was a school district that I worked with uh, that's in the Western suburbs of Chicago. Uh, this was before COVID-19. It was a low income district where um, they wanted students to make sure that they had access and they ended up developing a buddy program. Mm -hmm. And so they, the school took it upon themselves to make sure that the student had access and they didn't want to single students out, but they basically paired kids up and then made sure that there was a time and a place available for the students to, to have uh, internet access. And they had uh, different people in the community sign up and sometimes it might be a child going to an aunt's house and having a buddy go with them to the aunt's house that had the wi-fi access but the the school was very deliberate about finding and facilitating those networks of finding where the resources are and being deliberate about making sure every student had that access depending on your community also a library is an option um, mm -hmm. I've seen that just recently that the libraries are really looking at the situation and trying to play an active role. Um, how that develops will probably be individualized by your, by your location. And in some cases, even the school buses themselves became a mobile hotspot classroom where if you only have 10 kids on a bus that's designed for 30 or 40 social distance and still have internet access and still have a relatively warm quiet uh, place to learn with the high speed connection. So, so my only, my been only a lot of non-traditional thoughts like that. Sorry to interrupt, Greg. My only, uh, my only uh, piece of warning is if you are going to do a buddy system, you are going to, you are going to share a, a computing device that you do sanitize that in between use between the users. Um, lots of, lots of touching, uh, both on the keyboard, on your mouse and your touchpad. Uh, whatever it might be, that whole device needs to be disinfected before it's passed between the, the students. Right, and making sure that you're not mi mixing up the buddies too, or you're not getting larger groups. You know, you're able to, yes, use social distancing, and clean the device, but uh, you know, it, you're limiting the number of people that people are. And that was an unintended consequence when we were doing that. We were having hotspots outside our school and doing the bus system, and then students would obviously want to be next to each other. So it was, it was creating that kind of a hazard at the very beginning. So yeah, those are all things we have to keep an eye on for sure. Uh, at Walkerville, where I am, we're offering hotspots to any child who wants to have, any parent who wants to have that hotspot put in their home. Uh, the issue we have in some places is the fact that we don't have a phone signal. So it doesn't matter how many hotspots you have in a, in a house, if you don't have a phone signal, 
then you're not going to get any uh, new data and you're not going to be able to share data. So it's, it's going to be another, it's going to be a ratchet up from the spring with a lot of differences, which your slide, you know, uh, shows very well, Scott, but it's going to be, again, not without those challenges and not without a lot of deep learning and probably a few failures along the way as well. Okay, with that, um, we're running a little bit late on time, but I would like to thank our guests today, uh, Dr. John Monberg. Uh, thank you for coming today and sharing your perspective on what is a good virtual and remote learning environment and how to engage students. Scott, thank you so much for the recap of kind of where we've been, where we're going, the things that we need to be thinking about. Uh, Dr. Langdon, thank you for your perspective as a K-12 superintendent and the experiences that you've had. And I wanna thank the, uh, all the guests that are on the call for participating. I just wanna let everybody know that we will be posting this on our website. There will be a link that will come out in a newsletter shortly, uh, as well as a recap. Um, and while I still have you, I just wanted to share that we do have at the end of this presentation and the presentation will also be made available uh, on our website, uh, free resources that Scott was talking about uh, regarding several different uh, items such as curriculum. Uh, we also talked about upcoming grants, uh, quarterly grants, ongoing grants, and then we've also added online teaching resources from Zoom to online discussion tips, to tech tools and so on. So all of this will be available uh, within the next uh, probably four to five business days. So thank you everybody. And I hope that everyone has a fantastic day and the rest of your week. Take care. Thank you. Bye thank now. You, George.